where snow-capped peaks reflect in the deep blue water. Travel with us through breathtaking mountain landscapes and indulge in exotic cultures on a journey to the most beautiful mountain lakes in Asia. This is the Uvznur in Mongolia, a lake on the roof of the world. For the Mongols, the Uvznur is more than just a lake. Legends abound from as far back as the time of Genghis Khan that it's the home to all kinds of ghosts and dragons. Even today, it's surrounded by an aura of mystery. The Uznur covers an area of 3,350 square kilometers, is 84 kilometers long and 79 kilometers wide. Yet you'd be hard pressed to find a single boat on its shores. The lake itself is remarkably shallow, no more than 20 meters deep, with an average depth of only six meters. The Uvznor Lake lies in the Uvznor Basin in the northwest of Mongolia, right on the Russian border. The northeastern tip of the lake is actually in the Tuva Republic of the Russian Federation. It's approximately 800 meters above sea level. However, it's further from the ocean than any other lake on the planet. The journey to Uznur first involves traveling to the town of Ulangon, 26 kilometers southwest from the lake. Ulangon is the capital of the Mongolian province of Uvs, which takes its name from the lake. The province is almost as large as Scotland, yet it has a population of less than 80,000, and fewer than 23,000 people live in the town itself. Many of the inhabitants of Ulangom are children or teenagers who go to school or study here while their parents live as nomads in the surrounding countryside, looking after their livestock and always moving in search of the best pastures. This is a statue of Yumshagin Sedenbal. From 1952 to 1984, he was the pro-Soviet leader of the communist Mongolian People's Republic. He's still worshipped in Ulangom today as he was from the Uznur Basin and is still seen as a son of the region. Ulangom is not only the capital of Uvs province, it is actually the only city in this sparsely populated part of Mongolia. Many inhabitants prefer to live in the traditional nomadic yurts and gares. For 3,000 years, the people here have lived a pastoral nomadic way of life, keeping livestock and moving in search of the best pastures. Animal husbandry is still very much the mainstay of the economy around the lake. The animals that graze here are those that have adapted to the harsh climate of the Mongolian steppe. Yaks, for example, know how to forage for grass underneath snow, which cows don't or camels, the omnivores of the steppe, whose ability to withstand long periods without water is well known, and who can also eat all kinds of plants. And of course, there are sheep and goats, which are also well adapted to the climate, and which form the core of the herds of Mongolian nomads. The steppe around the Yuznur is a sparsely populated place, but as all animals need water at least once a day, there are often large gatherings of beasts at the small number of inlets. The traditional herd animals of the Mongolian nomads, known as the five jewels or snouts, are sheep, goats, yaks, camels, and horses. Yaks and camels may look impressive, and there's no denying that they are an integral part of the landscape here. But for the Arats, the Mongolian nomads, sheep and goats are their most important flock. These animals are perhaps the most basic subsistence animal for Mongolian nomads for a number of reasons. They are the Arats' main means of sustenance. Not only are they the key source of both milk and meat, 
but the wool from sheep and goats also keep the Arats warm in the bitterly cold winters. This gives the nomads a key source of their income. The fine hair from goat's undercoat is combed out to obtain cashmere, the main industry in this part of Mongolia, which is the second largest producer in the world next to China, with 3,000 tons of it each year. As well as using sheep's wool for clothing, it is also the key insulation for their homes. Sheep's wool is used by the nomads to insulate their yurts and gears, the tent-like structures they use as dwellings. Nomadic pastoralism, centered around livestock, has remained virtually unchanged over three millennia. The nomads around the lake still devote virtually all their day to caring for their animals. The Uznur Lake is the center of the Uznur Basin, and it is surrounded by other smaller lakes. There's an uneven distribution of water in the basin, which is sandwiched between two mountain ranges, and the western shore of the lake is considerably wetter and more fertile than the eastern shore. The drive along the western shore is comparatively comfortable. There is a tarmac road for the first 50 kilometers until the border crossing with Russia. Even so, the journey along the entire length of the western shore still takes a whole day. Apart from this one tarmac road, there is no other road around Uvznur. Even on this road, progress can often be slow, but this at least gives one time to appreciate the mystical surroundings. There isn't a single stone building on the shores of the Usnur. The cattle breeding nomads live in gares, the Mongol version of the yurt. The Mongolian nomads have not been completely untouched by the 21st century. Many gares are equipped with televisions and satellite dishes. But other than the satellite dishes, little has changed since Genghis Khan. Usnur has five major rivers flowing into it, but it has no outlets, a so-called closed lake. The current one is the remainder of a huge saline sea which covered a much larger area several thousand years ago. The water here is almost as salty as that in the Atlantic Ocean. The Mongolian nomads move maybe two or three times a year, once in spring in search of pastures and then again in autumn and winter to a place naturally sheltered from the elements and with barns for the animals to sleep in. Nomadic families tend to have one dwelling spot for each season where they return each year. On the Usnur's west bank lies the summer camp of Bargani Mayagma and his family. The land here is fertile grassland, and even during the sweltering heat of high summer, a cool breeze always blows in from across the lake. Every evening, Mayagma rounds up his herd of goats to prepare for milking time. The children all have to help out, and it's the girls who tend to help with milking and preparing meals. Nayam Zul, Mayagma's younger sister, helps him with the milking. Most of the time, she lives in the boarding school she goes to in Ulangom. But during the school holidays, she returns to her family, to her brother and her mother, Rush Yanjma, and to the beautiful steppe that is her home. Uvznur is a really beautiful lake. It's the home of the animals. Also, it's salty. Salt is important for animals and humans. That is why we keep coming back to the Uvznur. Before they milk them, Mayagma and Nayamzul have to tie the goats together, head to head, so they form a double road chain. This is an ancient Mongolian nomadic technique. It has developed because in the steppe there is often nothing to tie the animals to. Mayagma shows considerable dexterity in tying the goats together, and as for the goats themselves, the process of being tied together in this way is completely painless. They're more than used to it, and it's simply part of the daily routine. (laughs) 
Even Mayagma's young son, Belmin, helps out with the milking. In much the same way as farmers in the West tend to brand their livestock, Mayagma has painted his goat's horns blue so he can tell them from other nomads' animals. The closest neighboring herd of goats may be miles away, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Once the goats have been tied, Nyamzul prepares to milk them. As you would expect, the milking is done by hand, without using any machinery. Goats don't tend to give much milk. Mayagma and his family get between 10 and 20 liters from their herd each evening, during the fertile summer months. Plus, of course, whatever milk little Belmin gets for himself. The effort is worth it. Goat milk is regarded as a delicacy here. It's rich in vitamins and minerals, and the milk is used to make yogurt, clotted cream, and cheese. The cheese that is made from this milk is one of the staple foods of the Mongolian nomad during the long, freezing winters. Without it, their already hard life during these cold months would be harder still. The goats are tied together in the chain with so much skill that they can all be released with a single pull of the rope that ties them together. Then they are once again free to enjoy the freedom of the wide open spaces of the surrounding steppe. We live here in unison with nature. Just look at the beauty of the landscape. And it's true, it would be hard to better the view that Mayagma and his family have of the lake from their gear. And although life here is a simple one, it must be a truly magical place for children to spend their childhood summers in a playground framed by the mountains and the lake. It is now mid-August, and the short summer is already coming to an end. It's still warm during the day, but at night the temperature can already drop to below zero. Now is the time when the nomads need to start thinking about their next move. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Here we see a nomad family as they leave their summer encampment at the lake and move to their autumn base. Their gears are easily dismantled and transported. Their mode of transport is normally by camel, which is the main reason the nomads keep camels. They can carry heavy loads over long distances. Their destination is a spot at the foot of the mountains where there's more protection from the wind than on the wide open steppe. As well as a large range of birds and fish, there are also 41 mammal species in the mountains, including the endangered snow leopard. Happily to date, human behavior has had little adverse effect on the ecology of the Yug Snor. There are no industrial areas or factories for hundreds of miles, and there's very little tourism here. Lakes play an important role in the religious beliefs of nomadic Mongolians based on shamanism. They believe lakes are the eyes of the Earth Mother. The wildlife on the lake flourishes, largely undisturbed by any human presence. The Ufsnur Basin is a strictly protected area, which became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2003. There are more than 50 ranges that look after the lake. Serinjavin Batsush is responsible for the northwestern part. We drive around the lake once every three months, once in every season. 
Spring, summer, autumn. We observe the animals and count them. The local taboo against fishing helps to maintain the stock of fish in the lake. Local legend has it that there are no fish to be found. Mongolian nomads traditionally don't eat fish, and even today the local people don't attempt to fish. But the lake contains an abundance of fish, as can be seen from the thousands of cormorants and other birds that settle on the water. One thing that makes the Uznur National Park and lake so uniquely attractive is the contrast between the different landscapes around the lake. From the flat, largely treeless steppe stretching out to the mountains far beyond the West Bank. Close to the rivers that flow into the lake, there are proper wooded areas in which wild boar are said to live and where horses and cows can shelter from the heat of the midday sun in the shade provided by the trees as they drink the refreshing water from the river. And of course, the towering mountains can be seen from all around. Wood is a rare and valuable commodity in the largely treeless steppe. Because of this, the nomads make good use of every single part of the tree. Wood is particularly important in the construction of the Mongolian gear. The main frame of the gear, including the folding fence, the roof ring, the doof, and the roof poles, are all made purely from wood. If well maintained, these parts can usually last for many years before they need replacing. This is why great care is taken to regularly treat these wooden components. Because of the lack of wood, Arats normally heat their gears with dried dung from their animals. They also use any driftwood that may be washed up on the shore. Ranger Tseren Javin Batsush continues his drive on his tour of inspection around the lake. As part of his tour, Batsush often goes up into the mountains. This is where the grasslands of the steppe meet the mountain desert. Not only do the foothills and the mountains themselves contain important animal and polar species, but the mountain peaks provide the perfect vantage point from which to observe the animals and wildlife on the steppe and on the lake itself. His climb is a long and arduous one. It's hard work, but he finally gets to the top of the mountain. His reward is this breathtaking view over Uznur, its beautiful landscape and the rich array of wildlife. Just as the lake itself has a deep spiritual meaning for the local people, so does the mountain around it. Colorful decorated pyramids of stone or brushwood known as owus can be found at many scenic spots in these mountains. These are a form of shrine built to symbolize the special holy character of a particular place. Another of Batsusha's jobs is to pay homage to the spirit of the owu. To the Mongols, it's wrong to ask the spirit of the Owu for things that are to one's personal advantage. Prayers offered up here are often rather for things such as the well-being of one's family or clan, and the most common prayers are ones pleading for better weather, for plenty of rain in summertime and mild weather in winter. 
Uv's Noor is located in a dip between the mountains. This special location causes the high difference in temperature between winter and summer. In winter, it can be as low as minus 50 degrees. In summer, more than 40 degrees. So we have the most extreme climate in the world. As Babsush says, the Uznur Basin does indeed have the most extreme temperature fluctuations in the world. These pictures cannot adequately portray the bitterly cold weather that winter brings. Traditionally, Mongolian nomads don't raise crops. Most regions of the country don't have much snow, so the nomads don't tend to store up stocks of food for their animals to eat during the winter. They expect their animals to find their own food all year round. But here at the lake, because the winters are even harder than in the rest of Mongolia, the nomadic livestock breeders store grass from the marsh meadows as emergency winter food reserves for their animals. It is a form of agriculture that the nomads are not really used to, but a series of particularly harsh recent winters, when they lost over three million head of livestock, have underlined the importance of the collection and storage of food. The extreme weather attracts climatologists from all over the world who pore over the data collected from the meteorology station at Ulangom in search of clues as to the trends in global climate change. Current research programs are also aiming to unravel the rate at which the lake has become saline. One of the meteorologists collecting the temperature data every day is Bata Gansitse. We have seven of these stations and ten meteorologists who record technical weather data and visual weather observation every three hours and forward it via the internet. The data clearly shows how the weather has changed in our region. Also, the Uvznur changes itself, as recent research has shown. Climate change is causing more water to evaporate, so the level of the lake is sinking. The data from Ulangom is particularly useful for climatologists because of the extreme continental mountain climate. The differential between summer and winter temperatures is almost double compared to that in most parts of Europe. Here at Uvznur, the differential has been as much as 100 degrees. Changes in climate are therefore measurable more plainly in Uvznur than anywhere else on the planet. Just a stone's throw away from the weather station lies the Buddhist monastery Dechin Raujalin. And here too, the focus of daily life is all about the climate. The three Buddhist monks or lamas that live at the monastery are joined by hundreds of worshippers each day for daily prayers.
faithful worshippers often leave small sacrificial offerings to the heavenly forces under a stone at the monastery in the hope that their prayers will be answered. Those that can afford it can ask the three lamas, Lagua, Baldorge and Bachelun, to offer up prayers on their behalf. The most common wish is for better weather. There are all kinds of ceremonies here designed to ask the spirits for rain and mild weather. We believe that there is a sea spirit in Uznur. There is a male spirit. He owns the mountains. And then there is a female one. She owns the lake. We pray every year to the spirit of Uz Lake, as Buddhist tradition prescribes. We ask for forgiveness for our sins and read texts. This takes place at the beginning of summer, on the day of the spirit. The lake spirit. Why do we do that? We ask for rain and mild weather, so the plants can grow and the animals can reproduce, so that people can live in peace. So the work of the monastery is largely to pray for rain and mild winters. As well as taking temperature readings from the weather station at Ulangom, the meteorologists at Uvznur also need to take daily measurements directly from the lake. As well as measuring changes in temperature, it is also important for them to do tests in an attempt to discover the rate of salination of the lake. This provides scientists with as much key evidence on global warming as simply measuring the air temperature. Unlike the lamas at the nearby monastery, Meteorologists like Bata Gansetzeg cannot raise the people's hopes about the weather. From their scientific readings, climate change is making the climate around the lake even drier and more extreme, rather than damper and milder. On the eastern bank of Uvznur, there is a place called Zungobi. It has an extreme climate. Last winter, we measured minus 56.7 degrees centigrade, and then this summer, it rose to as high as 45 degrees centigrade. <laughs> But for Bata Gansetzeg, despite the clear evidence of the lake of global warming, there are real positives on the local weather. The sky is blue every day, and even her scientific mind obviously appreciates the mystical nature of the lake. Still, we are proud to live at the Uvsnur, the largest lake in Mongolia. It's enough to come here once a year, just to see the wonderful lake. You can wash your face in the water. And this is all you need to be happy and healthy throughout the year. In Mongolia, for a road to be marked on the map, this simply means that it is capable of being driven on. As we can see here, it in no way means that it will be paved with tarmac. The drive along the eastern bank of the Uznur is almost entirely along unpaved and rutted roads such as this one. And it is in effect a 100-kilometer cross-country trek into a semi-desert landscape. inlets into Uvznur in the autumn after a hot summer the river is almost dry where there were torrents of water earlier in the year after snowmelt now there are only patches of rivulets flowing towards the lake 
Now the animals are lucky if they can find any water to drink at all. Where the lake has receded, only salty ponds remain. At this time of year, people from the whole region come here to get their cooking salt. It is piled up here in big heaps, drying in the sun. These heaps almost look like igloos in a snow-swept landscape, rather than piles of salt in a dry lake bed. The degree of salination in this lake truly is amazing. This is the lake's eastern shore, as dry as a bone, and yet inhabited. Mongols are a nation of horse riders. They have been since before Genghis Khan's time. Their art in the saddle is sometimes unbelievable. Any nomad can ride as well as he or she can walk or run. They are trained from early childhood in how to handle a lasso. But the small Mongolian horses are incredibly resistant. They live all year round in semi-wild herds, and they are only partially watched over by the nomadic herdsmen. So in a battle of wills between a Mongol horseman and a half-wild stallion, it is still sometimes the horse that wins. When the wind rises over the lake on Uznor, on the shore, sandstorms also rise over the dunes. But both the people and the animals here are well used to these storms. According to local legend, as well as the spirit that lives in the lake, there is also a dragon in the lake at Ulsnor. The foam from the waves, so the story goes, comes from the dragon's mouth, and it is believed that the places on the shore of the lake where these waves hit will see hot and stormy weather. As the wind tends to blow the waves mostly towards the lake's hotter eastern shore, this legend is based on a degree of truth. Local folk singer Udgana Jamstran knows dozens of legends about the lake, one of which he's singing here. The legend he's singing about here is the story of Komi, Tovshu and Magtal belonging together. Komi is the act of singing, Tovshu is the two-corded lute that he's playing, and Magtal is the traditional Mongolian form of praise. Udgana Jamstran is praising nature, the lake and the ever-blue sky of his home. I sang this song when I was a child. There was a singer once. He taught me the song when I was a little boy. Later, when I was seven years old, 
I began to play Tovshu. After I had heard the sound of this instrument for the first time, and I thought to myself, I absolutely had to learn to play it. For most of the time, the nomads' livestock are left to run half wild. While these camels are left to look after themselves, their owners, Edorian and Bakhtir, sit in front of their gear and play a popular game from the region. <laughs> the game is called Five Gazelles, although the game has little to do with gazelles. <laughs> there are several versions of this game. The aim of this version is to knock your opponent's bones off their board. <laughs> <laughs> this game can easily take up most of a day. One game can last up to six hours. <laughs> Six hours is also about the time it takes to complete the process of producing these weatherproof mats out of sheep's wool. Producing the mats is an arduous process, involving flattening, turning and moistening the mats time and time again. Firstly, a number of mats are rolled up together. Then they're flattened by being pulled behind a camel, as shown here. The mats are then carefully unrolled. Then they are shaken out. And then moistened. Then the process starts over again. This is carefully repeated 13 times. 13 times the mats need to be wrapped, rolled, unwrapped, moistened, and rewrapped. It's a painfully slow and intricate process, but it is needed because at the end of the process, these mats are used to insulate the nomads' gas during the harsh winter, and they need to withstand temperatures as low as minus 50. Continuing the journey round the lake, framed by the mountains to one side, and the flat grasslands to the other the ponderous camels of the steppe observing you as you pass.
a trip around the lake uncovers all the ecosystems of Central Asia. Marshlands, deserts, various steppe formations and forests, rivers, freshwater lakes, alpine meadows and fields of snow. The Uvsnur Basin was made a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2003 because of the scientific importance of its climate, its habitat and the unchanging nature of the nomadic use of the grasslands over thousands of years. The main feeder river to Uznur is the Teskem River, which has its source in a freshwater lake in the alpine meadows of the Sangilan Mountains to the east. The Teskem then flows 500 kilometers westwards before emptying into Uznur. The spiritual center of the whole region is next to where the river flows into the lake on the northeastern shore. A brightly decorated blue owu in the middle of the steppe marks the site of an important celebration for one local nomadic clan. Twice a year, the feast of the river and lake begins at the crack of dawn, during which all the extended members of the large family, firmly rooted to Uvznur, come together to celebrate. The young and the old gather round the Owu. Most of them come from the region. Many, including most of the children, now live in the regional capital, Ulangom, and have traveled here for the festivities. Some have even returned home from Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, many hundreds of miles away in the west of the country. The feast starts with a prayer ritual in which incense and the ringing of bells play an important part. <laughs> Lama Shagjin Erdinabalik's Tibetan mantras are designed to appease the spirits of the lake. Again, the prayers and offerings led by the priest are joined by all the family members and offered in the hope of luck and prosperity being bestowed on all the family. As Mongolian nomads are a pastoral people, they do not have a single dwelling place or place of birth which they call home. Rather, their home is the whole steppe. But there is a place they will keep returning to during their whole life, and that is the family's owu, their spiritual home. <laughs> To much excitement, the Lama leads the members of the family in prayer. Our ancestors have celebrated the Feast of Sacrifice for the Uwu for almost 400 years. This tradition is kept up by all family tribes to this day. Twice a year, in spring and autumn, they gather at one of the 13 Uwus in our region and carry out this ritual. As well as praying, the Owu festival sees lots of singing and dancing. The festival takes place in September and marks the end of the short summer at Uznur. But although the onset of the harsh winter is fast approaching, for them, the beginning of autumn is a reason to celebrate. As with the traditional harvest festivals in the West, the festival is a celebration of the gift of life. It is in the autumn that the nomad's stocks of food is at its highest, and the mutton meat they enjoy is at its fattest. 
<laughs> the best singers and dancers in the whole region come to the festival and put on an extravagantly colorful show in the middle of the steppe. <laughs> the dances depict the pastoral life of the herdsmen, with the dance moves based on everyday activities such as milking animals. Other popular dances imitate the movements of horses and eagles, both of which are revered by the Mongolian nomads. festival to a close falls to the eagles, the highly respected Mongolian wrestlers. They take their name from the dance they perform as they enter the field of contest and to celebrate each victory where they imitate an eagle in flight. Wrestling is considered to be the most important of Mongolian historic three manly skills, the other two being horsemanship and archery. Genghis Khan considered wrestling to be an important way to keep his army in good physical shape. Wrestling is the most popular sport in Mongolia and has a strict code of conduct centered around sportsmanship. Quite apart from its aesthetic value, the dance is also regarded as an important warm-up and cool-down before and after an intense fight. As the festival ends, everyone goes home convinced that the best wrestlers in the whole of Mongolia are from Uznur, blessed by the indomitable spirit of the lake. <laughs>